In 1889, Copper King W.A. Clark and 74 other men wrote a state constitution to serve the needs of Montana's powerful interests with a weak governor, a secretive legislature, and special tax deals for the powerful. After 60 years under the copper collar, Montana was declared the nearest thing to a colony of any American state. The Anaconda Mining Company even owned most Montana newspapers, the Copper Press. The corporate dominance of Montana's political affairs was unique in American history. Seventy years after statehood, the Copper Press was finally sold and thousands of World War II veterans had been educated under the GI Bill. Newly enlightened Montanans wanted out from under the copper collar, and big winds of change roared across the treasure state. Changing Montana's constitution was the top priority. Strengthening the governorship, opening up the legislature, empowering citizens. Voices of Montana women, totally silenced in 1889, rang out loud and clear for these changes. When the Constitutional Convention began, 19 women were among the elected delegates. And when the delegates came together in convention, Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, men and women, young and old, sat alphabetically as equals, Montanans just wanting to make their state better. And so they did, producing a Constitution for the ages, the last best constitution. Now at its 50th anniversary, Evan Barrett and real history makers of the time shine a light on the creation of this remarkable Montana constitution. Welcome back to Last Best Constitution, our series of episodes about the uh, adoption, the writing and the adoption of the uh, 1972 Montana Constitution, which happened 50 years ago. We had a wonderful celebration of that 50-year anniversary this last summer up in the state capitol in the House Chambers, which they, call conven uh, they, they love to call Convention Hall they were, when they were CONCON delegates. And the remaining 10 living delegates were there of the 100 that were present in writing the Constitution. Uh, you know, the 100 delegates to write the Constitution were citizen delegates. The old Constitution required, that said that if you were holding office, you couldn't become a convention delegate. And there was a fight even went to the Supreme Court. Could legislators be in the convention? And the answer was no. So we had a group of 100 citizens who took an enlightened perspective, gathered together, uh, sat alphabetically rather than splitting up between parties uh, and shared the leadership, uh, shared uh, the power in the committees and uh, sat down as citizens of Montana and worked together. They produced a very enlightened document that is uh, uh, commonly known as being the best state constitution in America and constitutional scholars worldwide hold it in very high esteem as a really, really terrific document. We're going to get into the, what, what's in this document uh, with uh, someone uh, who you'll be familiar with, who was a, a key staff person uh, at a younger age, of course, 50 years younger, uh, uh, during the 1972 convention. Uh, and uh, the person we'll be talking to today is former Senator Ambassador uh, Max Bacchus. Max, welcome to Last Best Constitution. Thank you. Happy to have you here. Good to be here. Thank really, you. Really terrific. You know, uh, uh, this you would come back to Montana after being gone for a few years, but tell us about uh, the road that you took from being a uh, boy stater from Helena, Montana, uh, and to becoming a staff member of the Constitutional Convention. Kind of take us through that little route. Well, essentially, um, my roots are really home here in our state. Right. Uh, my, my family is a ranch just outside of town, Helena. That's where I spent a lot of my time growing up. <laughs> Stacked a lot of hay, <laughs> uh, pounded a lot of fence posts, <laughs> ran a lot of livestock. I loved it. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's with the soil, out of doors, the elements. I just loved it. So it's, it's really, mm -hmm. it's in my blood. 
And uh, my, my great grandfather actually <coughs> bought the place and started the place a long time ago. He came out the Missouri River um, and put together an oxen freight train at um, beginning at uh, Fort Benton because you know those steamboats came up. They couldn't. That's where they stopped. That's where they stopped. And so my great grandfather's name was Henry Seaman. Thought, well, hey, well, why not? Let's just keep on going. I'll put together this oxen freight train, and he did across the Mullen Trail, across Montana, over to Idaho. And along the way, he started getting the land, and he put together a ranch over um, outside of Culbertson. It was a diamond ranch just outside of, just east of Culbertson on the river, mm -hmm. and it just kept going. So it's just it's something that's been in my blood deeply. It just it carouses, it courses through my veins, um, the, the, the land and the nature of our state, the beauty of our state. It just meant so much to me, as it does to everyone else, everyone else who lives in Montana. So anyway, so I grew up in Helena, ranch, it's all that kind of thing. <clears throat> kind of turned the crank, went through the motions, and, you know, got in trouble a little bit, not too bad. And uh, then anyway, went on to him. Um, yeah, didn't we all? <laughs> yeah, we did. But to be honest, to be honest, I was a little straight-laced compared with, with some others. I was a little more bookish. I wanted to study and read, like doing all that stuff, uh, more than probably most. Anyway, um, off to college and um, law school. Now, before you get there, let me just ask you about because I've seen that, what I think it was a wonderful uh, photograph of you at Boys State. Yeah. And, and you were there with uh, Senator... Mansfield, Mansfield Metcalf, Metcalf and Murray. Metcalf and Murray. And Larry Short. Yeah. Who was, <laughs> yeah, and he was with you yeah. too, yeah. Yeah, that was, yeah, it was, it was wonderful. Um, uh, Larry Short was governor's, a governor of Boy State uh, back in 58 or 9, I forgot which year. Yeah. And I was elected the most outstanding citizen. You might ask, well, how in the world <laughs> did that happen? And, and frankly, it's, it's, it's kind of a lesson in politics. It's just, you got to get known. Oh, uh, they had a skit there, kind of recital. People play instruments and do stuff at Boy State and Dillon. <clears throat> well, I, back then, I could I could play the the, the organ, and so I um, I um, I played the organ. I played Apple Blossom and Cherry Blossom White. What's that? Oh a yeah, Apple Cherry Pink, Pink Cherry, and Apple Cherry Blossom. Cherry Pink and Apple Blossom, Blossom White. White. Yeah. So I played that, and well, people got to know who I was. <laughs> and so I got elected most yeah. outstanding citizen. Well, anyway, so Larry and I went back to Washington, the Boys Nation, and that's that photo you're referring to. And it was great seeing Mike. When Mike's obviously Mike yeah. Mansfield. Yeah. Mike's Mike and, and Lee's Lee. But one memory too is seeing Senator Murray just and before walking, he was yeah, done. Yeah, walking across the carpet to his desk. My God, that carpet was so squishy and thick. That's all I remember is how <laughs> squishy that carpet was, a red carpet, walking over to see him at his desk. Pretty posh, pretty posh. It was, but it was a, a precursor of things, apparently. Or, you, know, they, you know, after a while, kids were taking pictures with you when they went back to Washington later on. But, so you, uh, then you, you, meant, you mentioned you went to Stanford. Yeah, I went to Stanford, Stanford Law School. Then I, I, stayed, I, didn't, I didn't even apply for an Eastern Law School because I knew I was, I was going to stay in the West, uh, mm -hmm. either in Montana or somewhere. I'm a, I'm a Westerner. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, so I went to Stanford Law School, and I felt I should go East a little bit, learn what that's all about for a few years. Worked at the, the Securities and Exchange Commission there. Loved the job. They give a lot of power to young punk kids out of law school. My God, you get on the phone, you call up the senior partner of Cravath Swain or Sullivan Cromwell, whatnot, some big fancy law firms, and they hear it's the SEC calling. Man, they jump. You get these guys doing whatever they want, whatever you want them to do. It's, it's, I learned that you got to use power Carefully. judicially, yeah. judiciously, yeah. judiciously, yeah. It, it, very carefully. Yeah. It's um, anyways. After a couple of years there, I thought, okay, Max. What are you gonna do with the rest of your life? Yeah. And uh, it's about time now. You're about 26, 7, 8, something like that. And I thought, well, I want to come home. I'm gonna come home. I want to come home uh, because I'm a Montana, and I'm gonna get involved probably in public service because they just that's in my blood. I won't. That began really. I took a hitchhiked around the world for a year, four or five years earlier. Then Belgian Congo. It just hit me. The world's getting smaller. Our resources are diminishing. And I, maybe if I helped work to solve problems, people's problems, countries' problems, etc., then maybe our life might be a little better. That was, that's, that was really the key, the seed for me for service. So I got the phone, <clears throat> sit at my desk in Washington D.C. and I called <laughs> my parents. And said, "Well, guess what? I think I'm coming home." Great. Um, I might be entering politics. I might run for the legislature. Silence. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then we got through that. Then I said, well, 
guess what, Mom and Dad? They're, my whole family's very Republican. Right. And I said, well, I think I'm a Democrat. Yeah. Long, Long silence. <laughs> longer silence. <laughs> anyway, I came home. It's, you know, after a while, you know, the blood's thicker than politics. We all, the family got real well together. But anyway, I was sitting there at my desk. Would be a good job. Then I, 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 I knew that there was an upcoming const, constitutional convention at home. So I called up the president, Leo Graybell. I said, Leo, um, introduced myself. I've come back home. I'd like to work for you. I said, sure, you can work for me. I thought, great. So that's, I got started at the convention by working for Leo Graybell. Yeah, yeah. And you, uh, you made a choice to move to Missoula. Well, that's afterward. Oh, when I came back home, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a very interesting question. That's, that's a very good question. So come home. Where am I going to live? Not Helena, not where I grew up. Mm -mm. Um, Got to live someplace else. Went to Great Falls. Mm, not too wild about Great Falls. Um, Billings is way over there somewhere. Um, but I, I very much believe in, in the halo effect. First impressions count. You go someplace where you're not known, where you, can, you don't have baggage, and you can create your own first impressions by doing a really good job. So I decided that's where I'd go, I might add. When I was at, um, thinking about coming home and um, about where to go, I, Mike Mansfield strongly urged me to come home. Lots of advice, do this, do that, da, 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 da. And he asked me, he said, Max, where are you gonna live when you go home? I said, I'm not sure. He said, whatever you do, don't live in Helena. Bellway City. I knew exactly what he meant. Mm -hmm. Helena, that's, that's just where all those rumors are. People chasing rumors. And yeah. hell, that's not where the real people live. The real people live outside of Helena. Yeah. And I said, well, I'm going to go where the real people are. I don't want to go f f to the political town. So I, 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 went, I moved to Missoula. Yeah, and so you got a little law practice set up there just before the con con. Uh, kind of settled in a little bit. And, and then the con con started in 72. Correct. Uh, and and off you came. Well, there it's uh, it's it's interesting. And uh, you uh, you got to know and work with uh, the uh, you got to know and work with the uh, delegation from Missoula a lot. Right. Yeah, they're good. Uh, they're a good bunch. <clears throat> uh, I remember one or Herb Herb Watt. And I went. I talked to all the legislators <clears throat> before running myself. <laughs> I talked to Herb Watt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Marcus, I've got to hand it to you. I lost my first five times, but I got to hand it to you for going for it. It's going to take you a while, but you'll finally get there. Yeah. That's what it is. And oh, guys, Bill Norman, oh, they're a whole bunch of them. They're really good people. Yeah, those are the, and, and then the, uh, the delegates themselves who couldn't be legislators. Correct. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I look at that list and I, I wondered about your reflections about these people. Let me just kind of, let's talk about them for a second. Uh, Daphne Bugby. Uh, uh, tell me what you're... Uh, Daphne's a character. She, uh, brilliant. She's kind of emotional, um, strong views about stuff. But you, I mean, you put your finger on something, it's, it's critical. <clears throat> I think the success of the Montana Constitutional Convention and, and its adoption very much it depended upon that decision by the Montana Supreme Court. That decision, as you said earlier in your, in your intro, uh, decided that the current public servants could not be delegates to the convention. Mm -hmm. That was a hugely important decision because clearly, in my judgment, um, if um, current public officials, as current at that time, ran for the, uh, to be delegates to the convention, then the convention would be full of a, a lot of people who would be as much as anything else, pursuing their own political career on down the road. Which, and Daphne Bugby epitomized um, all the rest of the delegates. That is not a former legislator, not a former politician, not a former anything. She was just Daphne Bugby. She wanted to serve. And that's the same with everybody else yeah. there. Whether they're, uh, whether they're farmers, whether they're beekeepers, whether, yeah. they, irrespective of what they did beforehand, they're Montanans, they care about Montana, and, uh, and Daphne was one. You know, she had, uh, uh, she'd been uh, lobbying heavily for the constitutional thing to happen in the previous several sessions as a representative of the League of Women Voters, which was a real powerful influence on the convention. So she, she and uh, 
uh, Dorothy Eck. Oh, no the, question. Daphne was very strong with the league, with the league yeah. as was Dorothy Eck. There are, bunch, there are many others, too, but you're right. Uh, Daphne, when you, one looks back and reflects upon the convention, that's, that's a major force. Uh, the League of Conservation and Voters, that's true. You know, and you think about, when you think about the League and uh, women, it's worth noting that in the 1971 session, there were two women legislators. Out of 154 legislators, there were two women. Dorothy Bradley was on the House side and Tony Roselle was in the Senate. Two out of 154. And then when you opened the doors for citizen participation, there were 19 women elected to the CONCON. Yeah, they're great too. All yeah. of them. And nine were from the League of Women Voters, by the way. <laughs> really? That, that's yeah. not that surprise me. Uh, <clears throat> and you know, uh, 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 and it's also worth noting that the 1889 Constitution, the number of women delegates was zero. Well, times had changed. I mean, well, back then, they were back not, then. they weren't even allowed to vote back then. Yeah, I know. That's true. The, yeah. Well, that's true. That's, there's, there's no question about that. And times have changed. Yeah. And right now, I mean, look at not just. <clears throat> Congress, but look at other professions, legal, medical profession. It's, you know, frank, graduates of law schools now are, are, are more than 50% women. Yeah. Same thing with doctors. More than, it's just wonderful how that's changed. Well, and think of the, you know, when you don't let cream rise to the top, what happens? You know, it all curdles. Yeah, and well, so, it reminds me too, at the, <laughs> in the convention, speaking of a, of a woman, it's um, <clears throat> Jeanette Rankin. She spoke at the convention. Yeah. And I remember this this short little lady over there, Ben. She was fiery. She was just terrific. I was so impressed with Jeanette Rankin. And she got elected before yes. women could vote. She, in fact, she said her most her the thing that she was most proud of. To said this to Bob Campbell when he visited her when she came that day to visit the ConCon. You know, he told a wonderful story about how he kind of barged into her the house she was staying in. He wanted to talk to her, and he knocked on the door at 7:30 in the morning, and uh, the lady poked her in and said, "What? Oh no, is Janet Rankin here? Yeah, but she's upstairs." And he said, and he, he heard the little voice up at the top of the stairs saying, "Who is it?" And he said. Uh, I had one chance, and I said, you know, years ago you were fighting for women to have the right to vote, and I'm fighting for some other people to have some rights, and I'm, I'm a CONCON delegate. I wanted to see you. And she said, well, come on in. And so he got to sit that's, down with her. That's good. And, and, uh, and, and she, before that day that she spoke, and she said the thing that made her proudest was she was actually to in the Congress to vote for women's right to vote. And got it, and then they got it done. So you know how she got elected, though. She went around Montana, you know, women couldn't vote. So what did she do? She went to all the high schools and spoke at high schools, and she knew that the kids would go back home and talk to their parents. That's one thing she did over and over throughout Montana. Second, she had a very wealthy brother yeah, in Wellington D. Yeah, yeah. And I, so he helped finance a lot of that election. But she's a, she was a she's a real trailblazer. Trailblazer. Well, she was, and and it's often when you think about it, when they when Montana uh, voted to have the right to vote, which has happened before the national thing, uh, it the only people voting on it were men. And the men voted in the women's vote, you know, by a, right. not a huge margin, but enough margin. So there was enough enlightened men, uh, not only electing her to Congress, but voting for the right to vote here. Uh, speaking of women in the delegation, uh, tell me your reflections on Lucille Spear. She, uh, she is one of my favorites. <coughs> Uh, um, university librarian, yeah. and she had that little house over just up next to the university. I had to go visit her, and it was kind of small, she short little tiny house. little gal. She, she was, but also the house was small too. <laughs> but she's always reading, I and mean, she had big, big eyeglasses. <laughs> she's, I, and that's she's a librarian, but more than that, she was the seal spear. Um, and she had a brother, Oe Oe was his name. It was just really terrific. Um, but she was one I just really like Lucille, and, and and she was pretty tight with um, the, the executive director of the convention, and tight in a oh, good yeah. sense, in a good sense yeah. with Dale Harris. I mean, she mentioned when I first talked to Lucille before she was a delegate, and I was living over in Missoula, 
about Dale, how wonderful Dale Harris was. I think she was kind of a mentor for him. I think so. Yeah. He was, of course, mentored by Ellis Waldron but, and was one of his guys, but, but, but I think Lucille was kind of someone who guided him an awful lot. Uh, what, a, what an interesting presence he was. Uh, another woman in the delegation uh, was Katie Payne, uh, who was the spouse of the uh, Dr. Payne, who was the political science professor at the unit, my graduate school uh, professor, uh, uh, Tom Payne. Yeah, uh, I remember Tom more than I do yeah. his wife, frankly. And well, uh, and well, because she died very quickly after the convention. She, I just, she just, she was not, yeah. I mean, you know, don't forget, um, houses of Congress, Senates, yeah. conventions, they're just a collection of people. Yeah. Dumb, smart, fat, skinny, yeah. tall, yeah. short people. Just yeah. people. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's just, so it's, it's a great collection of people, but I don't remember. Much Katie about Payne. Katie. Yeah, about Katie very much. Uh, how about, uh, of course, our, uh, the ever present youngest delegate who says, I'm still the youngest delegate, uh, Maine Ann, Maine Ann Robinson Ellingson. Yeah, she's, she's quite a lady. Yeah. Um, I, th I thought. Watching her, she's probably more effective than anyone else. She's from Texas. Had that voice. So she had this, she, this, great, this wonderful combination. It is very sweet and nice and southern and just kind of seductive and it's talking <laughs> to people. That, but at the same time, she could be just tougher than nails yeah. when she needed to be and when she wanted to be. So it's a, it's a wonderful combination. But also very smart. Yeah. And you know, of course, the, she's so impressed some of the attorneys that were at the convention, to, uh, and non-attorneys too, but uh, Wade and, uh, was one of them, and, uh, uh, and, and Dave Drum, who was not an attorney, uh, and uh, <coughs> the, the judge from up in uh, Lake County. Uh, I'm trying to blank on him right now. Anyway, uh, uh, they said to her after that, her performance there, We'd like you, we think you should go to law school. Right. And she said, right. yeah, when she had three kids, her little kids at home, and she was going to graduate school, and her mother had died, she had the kids, and, and she said, yeah, okay, but I, I've got to get back to school and do this stuff. And they said, well, let us know. And a few years later, she went back and said, were you serious about it? And they said, yeah. And so they helped pay her way to, they paid sure. her way to law school. They did, yeah. Which she then repaid when she became an extraordinary uh, uh, she's, she's smart. municipal finance attorney. She's you know. good. Yeah, yeah. She is, uh, uh, I've been working very closely with her on the celebration of the 50th anniversary, and we're working on the this Friends of the Montana Constitution to kind of continue that uh, stuff that's been going on for years. Uh, uh, other people in the delegation, uh, John Toole. Uh, well, he's sort of the father, in a certain sense, of Missoula. I think it was was his grandfather's first territorial governor, I think, right, in Montana. Yeah, yeah um, tall fellow, um, uh, um, great character. I mean, character in the, in the sense of his uh, true, right. honest man. Um, Word is his bond. Um, <laughs> I keep thinking of John Tool Island. When yeah. I was a kid in Missoula <clears throat> in fifth, second grade, first grade, and going across the river there, Clark, for John Toole Island flooded out. There's an island there named after him, John oh. Toole, and it all flooded out. It's gone. And so after a while, it's put back together again, of course. But and he's very, he, John Toole, was very, and his wife Barbara, they were very good friends of my mother and dad when we yeah. lived in Missoula. We lived in Missoula a couple, three years uh, back when I was first grade. And uh, later, the mayor of Missoula. And I've forgotten that. That's yeah, right. Yeah, later the brother of uh, Rostol. Brother of K. Ross. Yeah, K. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, someone who made it seem like they made an impression on a lot of people was uh, J. C. Garlington, the attorney. Do you remember him at the convention? Yeah, um, <laughs> I think I remember about him is oh, what's his name? He barely got elected as a delegate. Right. And what's the guy's name from Missoula? Bob got, Campbell. Right. No, 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 no. It's, um, it was yeah. he would have been the only Native American had he been elected. Oh. Um, and he got lazy at the end. He didn't vote because he thought he had it. And he lost by about four or five or six oh, eight yeah. votes. Might have been 
might have been one or two votes. I remember that late at night, that, that, that was the final count. Who's going to win that? Gary, Gary's his first name. Oh, Kimball. Gary Kimball. It's yeah. Gary and, 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 and um, Mr. Garlington. It just locked it a very tight race, and, and um, Gary didn't make it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, Garlington made the wonderful speech at the end of the, end of the convention. He did, one of the best speeches, that's correct. Yeah, that just kind of summed up everyone pulling it did. together. It yeah. did. Yeah. It, was, it was very good. Yeah. Might have uh, helped <clears throat> Montana ratify it, too. The more that was out, the more people started to think. It, it, it appealed to the better instincts of human nature, um, his speech, Jim Garland's speech. Yeah, and I saw a, a, a thing that he did when he went to uh, speak to a group, uh, a major statewide group, uh, during the ratification time. And he just gave a nice pragmatic reason why this, you know, you gotta give this a chance. And yet you read it and it's so, it was so well thought out. Well, the reason uh, why a law firm, why he was the lead yeah. on that law firm of his. Heck of a law firm, firm. yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, George Helliker, George Helliker, reflections on him. He was a delegate from Missoula. Yeah, George. Um, <laughs> And was George one of the uh, one of the ministers? Uh, no, not, uh, that's it, it'll there were like second. five of them. But I don't think George, he may have been. I don't think so. Now George is, he struck, struck me as a little maverick. He spoke his mind. He said he want to say he's, he's from Missoula, correct? Yeah. Um, just kind of a, kind of a maverick. Spoke his own mind. Said he, said he wanted to say. I like that about him. He, he, he was not too easily typed, yeah. um, categorized. Um, his glasses on, his kind of quiz, inquisitive look in his eyes, and always searching, try to find the right thing. I liked him. Yeah, yeah. And uh, let me ask you about the, the last person from Missoula on that delegation we regretfully lost in April of this year, just before the 50th anniversary, was Bob Campbell. Mm who was kind of the godfather of the convention afterwards. He was secretary of the association, Kenick, the glue that kept those 100 delegates together for year after year after year until there finally were 12 and then 10 And when we lost him and Wade. Well, it's true, but <laughs> to be honest, my strongest impression of Bob, the only guy, the only guy there supporting marijuana. Um, uh, he, that's, he wanted to legalize marijuana, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and that's, that's, that's my strong impression of Bob. <laughs> Well, you know, he and Maine Ann wrote that beautiful preamble. Yeah, they did. Mm -hmm. You know, which was a, uh, uh, and uh, I have had him on a couple programs where he describes the process by which they wrote it and everything else. And uh, uh, he was an original, though. He was. Bob, you know, he, uh, he, he marched to his own drummer. Yes, absolutely. He did. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. <laughs> uh, and he, is, he was uh, uh, dearly missed. Uh, uh, at the 50th anniversary, because he almost made it, and and the same. And I, I wanted to ask you about Wade DeHood. Uh, you know, watching him in action. Wade's a typical, wonderful, self-confident trial attorney. Yeah. He um, and he, he cut from that bolt of cloth. I've seen Wade many several situations where he's just lots of bravado. And it sometimes gets in his way. <laughs> and, um, I went to the funeral going to that. But um, at the convention, one of my favorite times was when um, he and, and Maine Ann Robinson were d debating. Uh, I thought it might have been the right to know article, I'm not sure which, or maybe the environmental, maybe environmental article. The environmental, environmental one, article. I think, yeah. And um, essentially, there's a provision in, in the environmental article, which, in fact, you have a right to action somebody to sue to protect the environment in Montana, streams, forests, and whatnot. And um, it's, it's, it was a pretty strong, and it was one of the first environmental articles ever in a, in a state constitution. That, that was the, uh, and, and that was where they had the words clean and healthful environment. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so <laughs> Maine Ann was standing up defending it, and Wade stood up to object to it. And he's going on and on. Tell me now, Mrs. Robinson, this is just how how in the world would you ever enforce anything like this? And right off the top, without skipping the beat, main answer. Well, I'll tell you one thing. 
I never hire you as a lawyer. <laughs> I, never, I never hire you as my lawyer. The place just <laughs> rocked with laughter. It, it just, it's, it's, a, it's the most hilarious yeah. moment I remember at the Constitution. Yeah, and, and I think at some point as he was making those objections, I think somebody else got up and just actually gave him a simple answer and said, I assure you this would not be used to create more litigation for some reason. And he said, well, that's okay with me then. And he sat down and stopped objecting. I don't remember that. Yeah. All, all I remember is Bain and just, all is I remember a, is Bain and just put yeah. it to him. And, <laughs> and, and here he was, big Wade the Hood trial lawyer, yeah. put in his place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, uh, the, uh, now, let me ask you about, uh, uh, we, we, barely, uh, we barely talked about Dorothy Eck, who had to be one of those amazing forces in the Constitutional, getting them there through the League of Women Voters and then, and then being there, she was a vice president of, of the West. Uh, what were your thoughts about? Dorothy, uh, very smart, very intelligent, very positive, upbeat, always smiling kind of intellectual presence, um, helping give motivation to persevere. We could do this, and again, with a smile, and uh, the confidence, yeah. and with an intellect that uh, she knew that she was talking about. Her whole family's that way. She had a, yeah. she had a, a son, Lori, one of the oh, most yes. brilliant attorneys I've ever yeah, known. Sure. And Hugo Eck, her father, her husband, was brilliant, he taught architecture over right. at MSU. Her daughter and Diane. Daughter Diane, yeah. yeah. Another, she's just a very bright, but, but well, mean, not, not presumptuous. I mean, not ostentatious. Well, they're just very down to earth and just wanted to help. And Dorothy is one of those people. Yeah. You know, she, her history of ending up in the, in the legislature for so many years after that and being a big presence in Montana. Well, oh, she is, uh, no question. Uh, you know, uh, we were lucky enough to get her just before she passed away in our, in our last series that we did. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, how about uh, George Harper? Your thoughts about him? One thing that struck me most about George, um, well, he's a minister, um, a Methodist of St. Paul's, he's a church, a minister at St. Paul's Methodist in Helena. Um, it's, and he spoke well at the convention. But the thing that struck me most, it, he spoke at a funeral, and it, it really insight the why he, he is who he is and he was who he was. Um, he said that um, <clears throat> he wrote letters uh, uh, back to his family in um, some place, I think it was Louisiana, I think that's where it was. When, when, as a minister, he was sent out to, the, to Montana, was in Montana for a while, and I uh, just loved Montana, just loved Montana. And he wrote back letters to his family, uh, urging them to come out, to be with him. And the letters, what I remember most, I may not get this quite right, but he says, Montana, it's just so beautiful. It's just, such, it's, it's just so gorgeous, so beautiful that you can't have an e evil word about anybody. When you, when you see Montana, when Montana's in your, in your, in your blood and in your, in your bones, it just, you can't, have, you can't say anything bad about anybody because it's so beautiful. Uh -huh. yeah. I think exactly what it was, but something very similar to that. And I right. thought, man, that really says, all there is about you, George. You are a superman, and that's super person. And that's that's what it is. Yeah, he was, and of course he's the fellow that came up with the bumper sticker they used in the to to uh, pass uh, during the the ratification. Uh, Praise the Lord and pass the yeah, Constitution. Right, yeah, right. Uh, yeah well, he would. I mean, he was a minister. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, and to steal that, uh, no passing the ammunition, let's pass the Constitution. In fact, uh, his uh, 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 son, Rusty, held that up on the, during the 50th anniversary celebration, Rusty pulled that and held it up on the floor and, and made the point about it that that's what George they're, they're They're very talented, that whole family. Yeah, they were very one talented, the family, and Rusty, yeah. Rusty included. Yeah, and uh, uh, let's, uh, Let's take a second and talk about uh, uh, Leo, Leo Graybill. You said he was close to your family, 
And that helped you land, you know, end up No, here. no, he wasn't close to family. I just called him up. Oh, no, that's right. He wasn't. You called him cold. <laughs> I called him cold. Cold call. Called him cold, yeah. Cold call. Call him, Leo, let me, let me introduce myself. <laughs> That's all it was. <laughs> okay, no, it, you know, it was Tool that was close to your family. Yeah. But yeah, well, so Leo, uh, everyone, you know, he ran a tight, tight ship and a tough ship to get it going and make it happen. They did it all in 54 days. They saved up six days' worth of money to promote the Constitution, and then the Supreme Court said they couldn't do it. But in 54 days, to get that done is a pretty amazing thing for all these citizen delegates. And all of the delegates I've talked to, maybe it's after the fact, held him in such high esteem. But they said he really ran the place fairly. And everybody had the chance to talk. But once in a while, he'd kind of chide them a little bit about how long they were talking. But uh, what was your, uh, what was your I, thought? I don't know that the convention would have succeeded without Leo Graville. Yeah. He, he was the president. He was tough. He was no nonsense. He didn't. He didn't. You know, second guess Leo. Um, he he ran a very tight ship. Um, it was under budget, and that was very important because a lot of folks want to know that liberal bunch over there in Helena. They're going to spend all their money. And they're going to ask for more money, and they been pass that crazy document over there in Helena, and especially folks from eastern Montana and rural mm -hmm. counties were thinking that. So it was critical for Leo to be not over budget, but under budget. He could not go back to the legislature and ask him for, for more money. He had to be under budget, and was under budget. And he was very tight. Uh, lots of examples how you couldn't use a copy machine for this or for that, and there's lots of stuff. <laughs> but I will say this, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, you had to give a report once in a while to the delegates about the convention's finances. And I was in his office, we were putting the budget together, and something didn't balance. A couple of accounts didn't balance, didn't make any sense. And um, we, uh, one account was was over. And so um, and Leo said, well, that's okay, we won't tell him. You know, that doesn't make any difference anyway. We'll just say it's what we want it to be. And that's, so we walked out on the floor, and told all the delegates this is what it is. And it wasn't exactly right, but it was not too far off, so yeah. it was fine. Yeah, he, uh, uh, that, well, everyone speaks very, very highly of him, and, and all of them say it wouldn't happen. That's what I think. Yeah. yeah, and he was, for some reason, the perfect guy for the slot. We were lucky to get him to yeah. be the president. And you know, he they elected 12 in Great Falls, and he came in number 12. Mm. I didn't I don't know, know, that. know that. He was no. the last one that qualified on the ballot from Great Falls. Well, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and again, uh, we talked briefly when we were talking about Lucille Spear, but about Dale Harris. Can you, uh, uh, you know, which uh, he was kind of the godfather. He'd, he'd been with it, the whole con con concept way back when the Legislative Council was voting on. Uh, stuff and then when it worked its way through the reform commission and everything and the ballot and then get it get the con con itself uh, uh, I of course got to know him at those in those days and uh, uh, seemed to me boy he was a boy there he was a, a whirlwind and, a, and such a command of so many things but uh, what were your reflections on him? well um, they could, <laughs> we talked to several people <clears throat> who were indispensable to the convention. Dale Harris was one. He pulled it together. Yeah. Um, he, was, he put underlined <laughs> in red letters, executive director. He was the person. He put it together. Um, he was brilliant. Um, he, had, he, he was optimistic. He always had a smile. He's, he's blind as a bat. He had Coke, Coke bottled eyeglasses. Yeah. Um, once I was talking to him, once he went fishing up, <clears throat> up on the Blackfoot, <clears throat> lost his glasses. Oh God, his car is there, so he had to hitchhike back to his house in Missoula to get another pair of glasses and come back and, and, get, the and get, <laughs> get his car and his boat. <laughs> I mean, that's Dale. Um, but, uh, and he put together all the committees and he hired the, the, staff, the staff for for each of the committees, and those, those, those you know, the staff is not complimented enough. I hate that I hate that word, staff. The the, the, the people that, who were assigned to each of the committees, you know, the research uh, analysts. The, yeah, what research an amazing group they, they were. Together. They were brilliant. They're wonderful. I mean, even, you know, again, Jim Brady, Jim Grady wrote a book, Six yeah. Days of the Condor, or whatever it was. I mean, it's, all of them are just brilliant. I was I was in awe. 
of the, all those who were, worked for the various committees, they put together, constitute, they collated, they archived lots of different constitutions from other st uh, states around the country, like saying Bill of Rights, went to the Bill of Rights Committee, okay, what other, what other Bill of Rights provisions are there in the Constitution? It's a judiciary, judicial article, the same thing. And Dale was the one to put that all together. He hired all these right people, and he's an amazing, amazing guy. I just, I just, he, he was probably one of my favorites at the convention. Yeah, uh, when we and he died prematurely. He did. And uh, when we did the show for, about him in the Crucible of Change series that I did earlier, uh, the title of his the show we did about him was uh, Godfather of the Constitution. Oh, it's true. And. Uh, uh, and, and when I and, and in this particular series, we we brought all those research analysts forward that are still with us, uh, that can that are up to it. Uh, you know, Rick Applegate in the Bill of Rights, and uh, Bruce Severs in education, and Jim Grady, and uh, Rich Bechtel in the uh, in the legislative. Uh, you know, Karen Beck, uh, Karen Beck Kaplis now, uh, Roger Barber. There was an amazing group of talented people that, I mean, wow, to, ra to, to pick up that kind of talent and just uh, nurture them forward. And boy, they really did a job for the, for the delegates. Yeah, well, I think it's not quite the same point, but it's similar. I think it's another reason why the Constitution's pretty good. It's not perfect. Sure. Because don't forget, constitutions are written by people. They have all kinds of, of hopes, desires, wishes, all kinds of negotiations that compromised all parts, of different parts of our state. I mean, it's just, it's just, but the, but the main point is, I'm trying to make, is that one reason it succeeded, frankly, is because we're a thinly populated state. There aren't very many of us in Montana. And what does that mean? That means people tend to know each other. Right. And if you tend to know each other, you tend to develop trust right. with each other. And it's, um, it's, it's, it's very, very important. The second degree of, you know, the relationship is just so close. And, and that, so the delegates themselves tended to know each other, knew somebody in that other community across the state. The analyst, research analyst, same thing. They tend to know each other or, or somebody else in somebody, some other part of the state. And, they, they, and it's because it's Montana. It's a state where a state with so few people, we tend to know each other, and that develops trust. And, and there's certainly much, certainly a lot of trust back then. I regret to say, I don't know if there's that, as much trust today among people in our state. We've become polarized even in Montana. But uh, back then, there was a lot more trust. Well, you know, we uh, like to use the phrase that Montana's a small town with really long streets, mm -hmm. and right. we tend to know each other right. exactly. Right, it's very important. And and uh, mm -hmm. and they and 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 they did uh, know each other pretty well. And of course, we are what a million, not quite a million one right now, but we were maybe back then seven hundred thousand. Right, and so. Uh, yeah, we did know each other, and I, that did contribute. The other, another thing that uh, most of the delegates I've spoken to, and almost all commentators uh, attribute uh, to as a real positive thing in the ConCon that made a difference, was when they chose to sit alphabetically rather True. than splitting down the True. middle Very important. aisle. Very Give important. me your reflections on that. Well, it took away. <clears throat> First of all, the Montana Supreme Court said you can't run if you're you know, an, office holder, an yeah. office holder. So they weren't really office holders. But they had to run as either Republicans or as Democrats on the ballot. Right. If you're a delegate, you ran as a Republican, you ran as a, uh, yeah. a Democrat. So they did have the R and the D behind their name, even though they really weren't as partisan right. as they otherwise might be. So I, I, you probably know, I've forgotten whose idea it was, but again, Ordinarily, because people, Republicans and legislatures said one side, Democrats and the other, there'd be an assumption, well, I do the same there. No, no, no. Mm. Set alphabetically and um, made a huge difference. To, it really started to take away the politics if, to the degree there was any in the first place between Republicans and Democrats. And that's another hugely important decision. You know, it, it, uh, it, it, there have been a number of ideas about where did that come from. Uh, I've heard a lot of people uh, say Chep Blaylock, uh, and 
I have not been able to validate it anywhere. That could be. That sounds like Chet. Yeah. Chet is a school teacher. Mm -hmm. Chet was very positive. Chet had, <clears throat> Chet had a lot of energy from Laurel, Montana. It, I, if it was Chet, I would not be surprised. Yeah, and uh, and that that seemed to have made a difference. And I often wonder if uh, the people of Montana might be better served if if that concept was applied to our legislature because it's the we always had the division of the middle line but that division is mean is becoming more intense oh it is and, no question uh, it is uh, much more it's unfortunate uh the yeah uh, now uh when you were you were did a lot of different kind of jobs and i know at one point you filled in for for uh for dale when he when he had a setback and so you filled in as executive director for a while uh, and they gave you a title called coordinator of committees. What is that? What did that? What was that? Well, to be honest, it wasn't much. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't much. I was there to kind of help out. Yeah. Uh, really, it was, it was a Leo Grabell, the president, tend to put together, and more important, uh, Dale Harris. Yeah. Dale had it all set up. Dale hired all the wonderful people working for our committees. So I was just there to kind of help out, hold yeah. hands, do this and that. But it was running by itself. It just, it, it, and I was just there to help. You, so you were just uh, taking care of things. People they, needed, so something about, needed to happen. That's about it. Yeah, <laughs> well, about it. you know, <laughs> why not? Why not? Uh, now, let's talk a little bit about some of the content. Uh, some of the primary things that make the Montana Constitution stand out. Uh, the right to know, which includes open meetings and records. Uh, yeah. We have a real strong provision on that. Your thoughts? Uh, I don't know if any other constitution in the state has a provision as strong as ours. Yeah, it's sunshine. Uh, the right to know. It's, it's open. It's, it's transparency. It's open government. It's sunshine. It's, it's, and I'm sure it gave uh, Montana governors fits, other office holders fits. Um, but it's very important. Now, there's a way, there are ways to get around it, of course. You can have private meetings here and there, but the, the provision of the Constitution has been litigated. It's, it's been upheld by our Montana courts, and I, I, I think it's, a, it's a, really the, the gold standard of, of, of democracy. Well, after you get elected, the gold standard is, okay, open government. Open government, yeah. Well, you know, there's always, it's, it's interesting because, again, that wasn't the way it was with the uh, 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 the legislature prior to the Constitution, and the, in fact, it was extraordinarily secretive. The old legislature, yeah, it was. Uh, they didn't take in, hardly any recorded votes. True, and uh, and then the, when they say executive session. They'd say, well, okay, and they'd kick yeah, I mean, everybody I mean, out of the room. I mean, private session. Yeah, everybody. <laughs> the press is out of the room, the staff, is, and what they had is, and then they, they'd take action, and they, you'd be lucky if they tell you what they did. Yeah. It, it was pretty bad. No, that's true. Um, and we were ahead of, of the U.S. Congress in that right. regard. Yeah. I, um, there, I, when I was back there, a member of the House of Representatives, I wanted to go to a, a joint conference, House and Senate, on tax bill, yeah. and I finally found where it was. It was in a secret location, pretty, pretty much secret. Policemen stand at the door. I kind of fudged a little. I said, well, I'm a member. I meant to imply I'm a member of the conference, but I rationalized I'm a member of Congress, not the member of the conference. And the police said, okay, go in. Went in, it's a sea of people there, but they're lobbyists. And they, they got they, in. They exec, no, I'm yeah. back up, I mean, that's wrong. No. They, were, they were executive branch personnel. A lot okay. of people for the Treasury, a whole ton of people in there. So I just took a back out way seat. Nope, wouldn't bother anybody. <clears throat> Russell Long was in there talking about back as a kid in Louisiana, this and that, they weren't doing much. And anyway, some guy, Jimmy Burke from Massachusetts, shuffled up to me and he says, I'm sorry, you have to ask you to leave. Well, why? Well, it's the rules. Well, what rules? Oh, well, it's the Senate rules. And I says, well, I'm not going to create a fuss. I'm going to leave, but this is not the last you've heard of this. And um, I went out on the floor of the House that afternoon with a fellow named Ab Mikva from Illinois. Yeah, I remember him. And we just said, okay, we stood up on the floor and said, this is wrong. We have to have open conferences. They can't be secret. They got to be open to the public. Uh, and um, guess what? We the two of us got the rule changed. Well, there you go. As, Mont as Montana, I, I, I were, <laughs> it was my memory and experience of working for the Montana Constitutional Convention that helped a lot. Well, there you go. There you go. Uh, 
Montana has a unique thing in our Constitution that no other Constitution in America has, which is the right to participate. That, that doesn't exist. Now, it happens in statutes in other states, but nobody has in their Constitution but Montana thing that says, you as a citizen have a right to participate in the governmental proceedings before the government decisions are made. And that's become the reason why you have hearings and people are allowed to testify and the rules and regulations are published and all the announcements and, and the, uh, making sure that people know when the meetings are held and everything else. That's the right of participation. And it's unique in Montana constitutionally. Again, similar, similar feelings. Yeah, yeah, but it's interesting too. You know, these are such major changes compared to our old constitution. I mean, dramatic. Right. And um, I think the delegates did a pretty good job <clears throat> trying to find the right balance uh, by going, it was kind of a liberal leaning bunch. There's no question about it with all these provisions right. that we're talking about. But yet um, they had good judgment. They didn't go too far um, because they knew that it had to pass. And, um, it, and I, as a consequence of the decisions they made, it did pass, but barely, Yeah, barely passed. And, it, and many delegates who voted for it at, at, in Helena campaigned against it once they got back home. But still, it's, it, 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 and these things are all compromises. They're judgments. Um, there's nothing's 100%. And the delegates, I think, be, they're driven by doing the right thing. Yeah. And the right thing is the open provisions we're talking about here. Um, including the right to, to, to participate, but um, it's, they had to really be careful about not going too far, and, very, and they worked hard to finally ratify. Well, and they were uh, pragmatic in the sense of, because uh, uh, things like right to know and right to participate resonate well with anybody as a citizen, you know. Gee, do, should I have the right to know what's going on in the government? Well, they also yeah. got other things in there, like, yeah. I, <laughs> I, I forgot. It was the right to go hunt, hunt and fish. That's in the Constitution. Yeah, that was, yeah. And, gun, and guns. Well, That's course, in the Constitution. I think there's a gun, <laughs> our gun provision, a right to keep and bear arms in the Montana Constitution is perhaps the strongest in the nation, language-wise. And that's good balance yeah, yeah. compared to some of the other provisions. Yeah. And, You've uh, got to get it passed. And the pragmatism of uh, taking Bob Kelleher's uh, unicameral idea, which a lot of them liked, and they said, if we put that in there up for a vote with the regular Constitution, it'll sink it. So they put it on a side issue, and it was defeated. And, and the other hot issue was uh, the death penalty. We argued a lot the death penalty, and they said, let's make that a side issue. That shouldn't kill you. We shouldn't have the Constitution rise or fall on that. And then finally was gambling. That was a real, back in those days, there was, gambling was totally prohibited in Montana. And they made that a side issue. That one passed overwhelmingly, but they kept it out of the Constitution itself. And I think they were exhibiting a lot of pragmatism about how well, to another vision there. It's, it's, I, I often think of a, <clears throat> it's not in there, <clears throat> but it was, <clears throat> it was Bob Kelleher <clears throat> uh, from Billings. <clears throat> right. Advocated for a parliamentary form of government. Right. And you know, there's something to be said about that. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> you know, without going too far afield here, <clears throat> you know, we in America you know, don't have parliamentary forms of government. In Britain, France, you know, <clears throat> the, the majority. Most of them a, do. Yeah, most of the democracy. The majority yeah. that's elected is the government. And so the, the, the government is able to pass legislation because their, their party is the majority party. It's just the way it is. Not so in America. Our founding fathers, <clears throat> and it's reflected in our state constitution, so distrusted power, leaving Europe and England, that they spread power out everywhere, all the three branches. They spread it out they, so far, in a certain sense, nobody has power. Yeah. Uh, the court does it. But the executive branch thinks the Congress has it, Congress thinks the president has it. But as a consequence, mm -hmm. we don't have strong political parties today. They were stronger earlier, but the, the strength of parties has, has diminished very significantly compared with Europe. They're stronger in Europe. 
So the question is, um, the degree to which our form of government, as much as we love it, and there's none better um, in our view, tends to make it more difficult to push back against the extreme elements um, in our country, like the right wing say, or the left wing say. It's, um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a question. In many ways, Bob Kelleher strongly argued for a parliamentary form of government, gave all the reasons. Of course, we never adopted it, we never would in America, but um, it, was, it, was, it, it, it was provocative. Mm. It forced you to think about what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. Uh, when we think about the legislative here for a second, one of the things that came out of the legislative, when you ran in 72, you ran in the old multi-member districts. So yeah. you were one of 12 people or whatever elected, or eight people. We had, we had eight districts. Eight districts. In you had eight uh, delegates. And then, when, then suddenly they became single member. Uh, so with the idea of uh, the voters would know who their single legislator was, right. and the legislator would have fewer people he had to know and represent, he or she had to know. Your thoughts on uh, single member districts? I think it's right, it's the right thing to do. On the other hand, <coughs> when I was in, running for the legislature in Missoula, I knocked on virtually every door in eight legislative districts. And I got to get a good feel for what people are thinking, what's going on, what do people want. Um, and that, that, that I found it very helpful help, as a legislator, you know, what people are thinking. Now, is it one, you know, one district, one person? That's probably better. It's probably better because then you know who your person is. That's, that's, I, I come out on that side. Yeah. The uh, I interesting uh, thing is, now let me, there, there's a little controversy we've been going last session and in the courts between, and we just have a few minutes left, but uh, the idea, the, gar the guarantee in there for an independent and nonpartisan judiciary, how important that is to democracy and the, and the, the separation of powers, uh, that's the way our Constitution was drafted. It seems to be under attack now. Right. Uh, well, my first, my view is, <clears throat> first of all, it's important to have a judicial commission to help the executive make the right decision. And frankly, when I was <clears throat> in the Senate and I had the opportunity, the privilege to um, to recommend um, uh, nominees to the president back then, it was it was Clinton to be on um, the uh, circuit court or federal right. district court. I put together a commission. I have six people. I got the, got the six best, and I said to them, I want you to give me three names. I don't care if they're Republicans or Democrats or where they are. You give me this three of the best people in the state of Montana who are, who are candidates to, to serve on the Ninth Circuit or <clears throat> yeah. federal district. I just felt it's very important to have right. that. And I, guess, and I think it's wrong, frankly, that, that, that we don't have that today anymore. That is, the, uh, the, the Governor Gianforte, it's my understanding, has pretty much disbanded that. But I think it's wrong. But I also think that that appointment of judges without re-election is important because the, our judiciary is becoming more politicized too. Not just our legislatures, but our, judicial, our judiciary in mm -hmm. states and the Supreme Court are becoming more, more and more politicized. Now, of course, Supreme Court, you're there for life, but um, I think in, in states, it's important for judges to be appointed for a long period of time, maybe a term limited, maybe 20 years or something, maybe age limit, but I think when they run for re-election, as was the case in our state just right. a couple of weeks ago, that tends to politicize the court. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's kind of a, uh, an interesting question, the election thing. And, and one of the pragmatic decisions I think the delegates made was we don't want to take away the vote of the people on too many things or we'll lose this election. And it was probably a right judgment, but it, it did lead to a... Well, same thing with all our other statewide offices. Yeah. Superintendent, you name it. A lot of other states don't have as many. And when we were talking with Karen Beck about that, the executive article, which I worked on through executive reorganization, uh, it was the boy... If we take trim it down to just the governor and the lieutenant governor, we're not going to get this passed. And uh, well, we're running out of time. It has been a short but a wonderful session, and I greatly appreciate you finding the time to get here. And uh, we've known each other for all these 50 years. It's been a while. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I appreciate our friendship. 
and I appreciate greatly your service to this state and to this nation. Oh, thank, uh, you. thank you so much. And thank you. For all of you who are watching, this has been a real special edition of Last Best Constitution. And we're going to continue with the rest of the series, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you.